Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Asia Society and our global online platform. I'm Tom Nagorski, Executive Vice President of the Asia Society, uh, coming to you again from New York uh, today. Welcome uh, to our audience, wherever you may be watching, uh, and welcome to a longstanding uh, Asia Society tradition, our year-end Asia Forecast Program, uh, in which we uh, get some experts from uh, around our world and our network to prognosticate a little bit about the year ahead. Perhaps it goes without saying, as we look back at the year gone by, that our forecasters one year ago, and we looked and it's exactly one year ago today, uh, they suffered a little bit, no fault of theirs, because they couldn't possibly have imagined what was coming. And that virtually every bit of news in almost every part of Asia and the world would be so dominated uh, by the virus that just then was wrecking havoc, uh, or beginning to do so in Wuhan. Today, we look ahead uh, to 2021 and what we certainly have to hope and imagine wherever we're looking uh, will be a better year. And we're gonna do things a little differently this year, taking advantage of the online platform uh, by wandering around the world, literally, uh, to bring in some great voices and expertise uh, from all across Asia and the globe. We'll go in quick round robin style, about 10 minutes each with our five experts giving us predictions from their areas of geography and expertise. And then we'll bring them back in uh, for a conversation with the audience. Uh, and I invite you all uh, who are watching today uh, to send predictions of your own, to send questions of your own, as always using the, uh, uh, the chat functions uh, in Zoom or on Facebook where, uh, I'm sorry, YouTube and Facebook where we are streaming this event. So to begin our look at Asia in 2021 and what the year ahead may bring, we go first to Hong Kong. And if we can bring in wage and Sean, who is joining us from Hong Kong, a great friend of the Asia Society. Uh, Sean has appeared uh, at events uh, with about a half dozen of our global centers now in person and a couple of times this year virtually. Wei Jin Shan is chairman and CEO of PAG, a Hong Kong-based private equity firm. Before that, partner at TPG. And before that, a managing director of JP Morgan and assistant professor uh, at the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Sean is the author of two uh, memoirs, uh, the first of which, uh, Out of the Gobi, My Story of China and America, I can tell you uh, is a, a masterpiece and a very compelling story of uh, his journey uh, from his years as a teenager in the Gobi Desert during the Cultural Revolution and how he wound up ultimately uh, at the pinnacle of his field. Sean, it's great to have you with us again, uh, and, and we asked all our participants for uh, just some, uh, without, you know, giving it away to me, uh, what the uh, prime areas they'd each like to focus on for their forecast for 2021. Sean, you've, you've chosen a pretty fundamental, perhaps the most fundamental question uh, that we have at the moment for Asia, which is what the econ economic recovery may look like. And we know that in some places um, in Asia, it's already underway, China uh, in particular, but uh, let's begin with that broad question. Uh, you know, what do you see the economic recovery uh, looking like in the year ahead? Uh, where are the, the, uh, uh, the areas uh, where you have the greatest optimism? And then maybe we'll come around to the challenges and trouble spots after that. Sean? Tom, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, my collection is a little different from yours. You say that I suggested the subject. I thought you ordered me to do so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, I remember that uh, the uh, famous economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, once said that there are two types of forecasters. One type, those who don't really know. And the other type, those who don't know that they don't know. I think I'm the uh, first type. Uh, it's exceedingly difficult, as you have pointed out, to predict the future. Nonetheless, I think we can ask the question, if the current trend continues, what the future will look like? And for some events, we also know that there are certain causal effects. For example, we know that the vaccines will eventually stop the pandemic. And it seems 
that in all probability, the vaccines will become widely available by probably summer or autumn of next year. And therefore, that is probably the time when the pandemic will be stopped or disappear. And meanwhile, I think we can look at the trend in different countries to think about if such trends continue, how the economies will look like. And if I'm correct, the US economy at this moment is actually in the second dip. I think there was a first dip back in the second quarter, then there was some recovery, then the pandemic became worsened. And then I think at this moment, we are experiencing a second dip. But in all probability, American economy is likely to recover throughout the next year, but won't recover fully probably towards the end of last year when vaccine really stopped the pandemic. I looked at a study by IMF, which suggests that the US economy will recover to 2019 level in 2022. So next year will be the year of recovery with the vaccine, the advent of vaccine. I hope we can avoid a third dip. You, if you look at Asia, of course, the largest economy in Asia is China. And China's economic recovery is suspected to continue. In fact, the recovery started in the second quarter. In the first quarter of this year, the Chinese economy came down by 6.8% from the same period of last year. And that was, of course, induced by the lockdowns. In the second quarter of this year, the Chinese economy grew by 3.2% from last year. And in the third quarter, the growth rate has gone up to 4.9%. And it is widely expected that uh, this recovery will continue. The consensus among the economists and research institutions is that the Chinese economy is likely to grow by about 8% from relatively low base of this year, next year. And the IMF, the same study, which predicted that the US economy will recover to the same level of 2019 by 2022, suggested that the Chinese economy will grow by about 10% from 2019 by 2022. I think that's likely to be the case, uh, unless you know, there are big surprises. And the reason that China has been recovering so strongly so far in the past three quarters is because the pandemic is very much under control. In fact, China has practically eliminated the virus. It will have to test its vaccine in foreign countries because it won't be able to find subjects in the country. So assuming that the situation is under control and assuming that vaccines will help restore some international travel, I think the economic recovery trend uh, is expected to continue. Other countries in Asia will fare differently. Vietnam this year will be probably the second country in the world after China to register a positive growth because the pandemic is very much kept outside of its door. India, on the other hand, is in much worse shape. And I don't expect the Indian economy to even recover to the 2019 level by the end of next year. Uh, right now, of course, India is still experiencing negative growth. And I think next year, it will come out of the pandemic, assuming vaccines become available in that country very slowly. But I think the recovery probably will take about two years. 
Let me just stop here in case I spend too much time and see if you have any other no, questions. No, no. It, it, it's it's super helpful and and by the way i mean you just you made a point that i think we all know but it's 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 mind boggling when you sit here in the united states to think that china has has done so well uh in terms of eradicating uh, um, uh, or coming close to 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 beating the virus that that they don't have enough uh patients to participate in some of these vaccine studies that's certainly not a problem we have here but um it, the way you you paint the picture sean i mean you make a pretty basic point that that recovery depends really on pandemic related issues, right? How countries dealt with the lockdown and then uh, the prospects for, for vaccine. I wonder if I can ask you, because we've had another little event in the world, which is uh, Joe Biden's election. And much has been made about, uh, you talk about predictions. <laughs> there are a lot of people predicting a lot of things in terms of whether uh, a Joe Biden administration is going to have much of an impact or a, an effect on the US-China relationship. Some saying, well, you know, you have, you have more stability, you have uh, someone who values, a, a, you know, a, a potentially better US-China relationship and maybe just more competence um, uh, at, the, uh, at the level of those who'll be dealing with it. To what extent do you think um, a Biden administration will impact uh, economic issues for China in particular? Um, or is it just, uh, is China going to sail along at those levels, uh, you know, no matter what the, um, uh, the new policies? And of course, there are those who say Biden's going to be equally tough on China as Trump was. How much does that matter? Oh, I think it matters a great deal. China and the United States are each other's biggest trading partners. So, uh, you know, the economic uh, uh, dependence between the two countries is very substantial. And the relationship, economic relationship, has been at the nadir at this particular point in 40 years, with, uh, of course, in the past two years, the trade war, and then followed by technology war, and to some extent, the financial war as well. I don't think that uh, the economic relationship will improve immediately under the Biden administration but I would expect the relationship, as you just indicated, to become more stable, more predictable. Even if Biden's policy or the policies of the Biden administration towards China remain tough, I would expect it to be consistent and stable. You know, the United States for the past half century has had a rather consistent foreign policy, except I think in the past four years, when the policy became somewhat unpredictable. I would think that uh, the policy will return to predict predictability and to stability under the Biden administration. Another thing is that uh, I would expect the Biden administration to work more with uh, international institutions, which really form the framework of the World Economic Order, institutions like the World Bank, IMF, uh, WTO, various trade agreements with Mexico, with Canada, with Europe, and, and so forth. So to the extent that uh, the Biden administration is willing to be multilateral, is willing to work within the framework of international institutions, I think that would improve the economic relationship with China because China is very much willing to work within that framework as well. Okay, I have one last question and maybe a, a, a brief answer to this one, Sean, for you. And, and uh, I think I know uh, how you feel about this, but Hong Kong itself has had uh, a, a rough year in many ways, um, but from a financial standpoint, uh, which is the area in which you work, do you, uh, see Hong Kong's position, uh, uh, long-held, long-standing position as a great free financial uh, center uh, compromised in any way, uh, given uh, what's happened with uh, the national security law, with other um, actions of, of the mainland, um, or, or is, it, is it business as usual uh, going forward, do you think? In fact, uh, Hong Kong uh, didn't have a tough year this year, as it did last year. Last year was really bad, especially in the second half of last year, 
when there was violent unrest on the streets, when many businesses were forced, including schools, were forced to shut down, including ours. So in the second half of last year, Hong Kong economy already went into a recession when the rest of the world was booming. You know, Chinese economy last year grew 6.1%, American economy 2.3%, mm-hmm. and yet Hong Kong economy went into a recession because tourists were turned away. In the second half of last year, tourism dropped 38%, led by a 40.8% drop in the number of tourists from the mainland. And Hong Kong's economy depends on tourism. And basically, there are two sectors, financial services, and then everything related to tourism. So when tourists go away or don't come to Hong Kong, of course, the economy suffers. This year, the stability has returned, especially after the national security law is enacted or was enacted back in July. The financial sector was never much affected because the financial sector doesn't really depend on the local economy. If you look at the stock exchange of Hong Kong, which is about $5 trillion in market cap altogether, about 80% of the listed companies are not domiciled or don't operate in Hong Mm -hmm. Kong. They are from China and elsewhere. The local economy continues to do very poorly this year because this year tourism is even more down than last year. Last year it was 40 some percent. This year it's almost 100 percent or 90 some percent. So the economy, local economy is in doldrums. And I expect the local economy to do very poorly in the foreseeable future. But the financial market has been booming this year, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. elsewhere in the world, you know, in New York, in London. And the stock market, for example, three months ago, I would tell you is $4 trillion. Now it's $5 trillion. Mm-hmm. And many companies come to Hong Kong for public listing, and there are issuance of bonds as well. And I would expect Hong Kong's financial market to continue to thrive next year and in the years to come. Okay, Wage and Sean, we're gonna to need to leave it there with you, but thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, in the evening, your time in Hong Kong. Uh, let's go west now uh, to Dubai, where we find our friend Saad Mousseini. Uh Saad is chairman and chief executive of the Moby Group. Uh, he founded Tolo News, the first 24 hour news network in his native Afghanistan a little over 15 years ago. Uh, Saad Mousseini is an alumnus of the Asia 21 Young Leaders Network, recipient of our 2013 Asia Game Changer Award, and currently serves on the boards of the International Crisis Group and the International Center for Journalists. Uh, Saad, great to have you with us. Um, I wanted to, you you offered us uh, three very different predictions, and I'll just maybe give the thumbnail and, and, and perhaps you can do the deeper dive. Uh, on, uh, on foreign policy, Uh, you said that you expected, quote, a more responsible approach to issues and not just from the United States, but also more toned down uh, rhetoric and actions from China, Russia, and Turkey. So I guess that's good news. Can you explain uh, why and where we think we're going to be getting a more responsible uh, approach to to policy questions in Asia? Well, I think uh, I I would almost uh, cut and paste Sean's uh, messages, but in a sort of political context, I think that the, the, what we've witnessed in particular in a, in a place like Afghanistan and the Middle East, where we have a, a quite a large uh, presence, is that uh, because the administration, in particular the White House, was so disengaged and not particularly caring, others stepped in uh, and the vacuum provided all the opportunists um, in the region and beyond with, um, with, with, with sort of a couple of years to do the sorts of things that they wanted to do, whether it was Iran and Syria or the Russians elsewhere or the Turks and the Caucasus. Um, and of course the GCC and, and, and Yemen, something they had started during the Obama tenure, but they continued and others in Africa. Uh, I, I think they made the most of it. I think in a, in a new administra- in a new uh, environment, they may be more reluctant to do so. 
Having said that, uh, I think they're going to be more. There's going to be more responsibility, but I'm not sure how effective the Americans will be. Uh, I'll give you one example uh, with Afghanistan. The the Americans, obviously, the State Department and their special envoy uh, for Afghan reconciliation, Khalilzad, a career diplomat, um, stepped in, negotiated a fairly fairly interesting deal uh, with the Taliban. Uh, where the Taliban re- would reduce violence, the Americans would start to draw down, the two Afghan s- sides would sit, um, and the Americans have a timeline of like, you know, 12 months plus to draw down uh, if certain conditions were met. Uh, President Trump um, all of a sudden decided he was going to pull all the troops out and announced so in October of, of, of this year. Now, th- that put the diplomats uh, in a bit of a bind, obviously, because that there goes their leverage. Now, somehow, you know, we've seen Trump reassess a little bit and the troops uh, will go down to about two and a half thousand. But on January the 20th, Biden will be faced with a very, very difficult decision. Two and a half thousand troops are not quite enough to, 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 to have maintained enough leverage over the Taliban so they could go and negotiate a peace deal. And because of the sensitivity to you know, continuing these endless wars, he's not going to be able to increase uh, the number of troops on the ground. So as much as he may wish to do things differently, he has to deal with a situation that he's inherited from uh, President Trump. Uh, similarly in Iran, I mean, I think time has moved on. Uh, Obama probably was a little bit too desperate to negotiate the deal that he negotiated with the Iranians. But today in Iran, it's far more radicalized than it was. The, the liberals no longer have the leverage. They no longer have the momentum. They probably don't, no longer have the popularity. So I'm not sure how much more he can do in a place like, um, like or with the Iranians, for example. The GCC countries, the Saudis and the Emiratis have taken things into their own hands. They have a peace deal with the Israelis. They're far more active in the region, certainly more, far more active in Central Asia and South Asia than, than they were four years ago. So yes, it's good to have a grown up in the room with, in, uh, with, with the Biden administration, but again, I'm not sure how much more they can do. So it's, it's gonna be, a, we're gonna have a more responsible team in the White House, but I'm not sure how much more effective because you know, after four years of, of, of a fairly irresponsible administration, there's only so much he can roll back. So I think that this, it's, I'm, you know, obviously we're, we're all relieved that we have a more optimistic, we, we have a more responsible team in, in DC, but at the same time, we have to manage our expectations. I think um, there's only so much they can do and some things will take a long time to fully reverse. Uh, the multilateral arrangements and, and, and the, the relationships are very important, whether it's with the environment, for us, more importantly, with NATO, and of course, all the trade deals. These are all important. Uh, and I'm, I hope Sean's right that we can, we can, you know, more engaged world uh, and more responsible approach to things uh, is going to bode well for a whole range of things, the environment, security, and, so, and trade, and so forth. But... Um, but I'm so concerned. I mean, I still have uh, deep concerns over the potential for, for further conflict. If the Americans draw down very quickly in my home country of Afghanistan, there's no doubt that the Iranians will step in. The Russians may need to step in. The Pakistanis have always been in there. The Iranians will step in, the Indians and so forth. Uh, it just means that more complications for, for our region. So uh, you put a lot on the table and, and thank you, Saad, but just to stick with Afghanistan for one more moment, Obviously, Joe Biden, you know, as hamstrung as he may be, he's been through this discussion before, right? I mean, he basically was in the room when, uh, in, you know, in the early days uh, and even not so early days of, of the war in Afghanistan. And so he's presumably quite aware uh, of, of the issues that you raise. What do you think, uh, you know, it, he, where, where do you think he's likely to... Uh, to land in that conundrum of you can't really produce more or, or, or add more troops to the mix, uh, but being well aware as he is and his security team is uh, about the risks of actually following through with a full withdrawal. Well, I, I you know, if you listen to uh, people like, uh, um, uh, you know, his main security, uh, national security folks, his main advisors during the campaign, um, you'd hear that 
we want to draw down, but we want to obviously engage uh, with the residual forces. We want to ensure that Afghanistan it doesn't turn into another um, hub for terrorists. It's easier said than done because the Americans have signed an agreement with the Taliban that they are going to fully disengage by May of 2021. And the Taliban actually yesterday stated that if the Americans stay beyond May, even if they have five individuals, then it's open season as far as uh, international troops are concerned. So this is the dilemma for Team Biden. I think Biden was never a firm believer in a large presence in Afghanistan, but he also sees the risks uh, in terms of drawing down very quickly. M- my sense is that they're gonna come, they're gonna come in and they're gonna quickly use the three or four months that they have left in terms of their agreement with the Taliban to push for a peace deal. But it sounds like a bit of a Hail Mary pass um, from their side. And um, you know, I, I you know, um, Tony and Jacob, you know, very responsible individuals. I mean, they're very engaged. They're not the sort of uh, isolationist type uh, individuals that, you know, over the years we've seen what they've said and how they've talked uh, about different issues. But I still think that they're going to have their hands behind their, tied behind their, their backs in terms of what they can do. Now, speaking of hands tied behind their backs, uh, on Iran, you raise a really interesting point uh, in, your, in your first answer, which, uh, you, you know, here it's very, it's very uh, common and, uh, you know, to hear people, uh, political analysts here in the United States say, oh, here are the things that, Joe, that the Biden administration is going to try to reverse or, or re-engage on, and they list the Paris Climate Accords, they, they list the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, and then the Iran deal. But as you say, just because, I mean, just because the United States may wish or a new administration may wish to do so, speak if you could from, from the perspective of Iran, which as you said, uh, has radicalized since then. What, what, what uh, let's say for argument's sake that, that, you know, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Joe Biden want to re-engage. Jake Sullivan was deeply involved, of course, in the, uh, in, in, in the deal itself. Uh, what are the pitfalls, uh, to, to re-engagement, given where Iran stands right now? I mean, how, how would that well, Iran, I, I, I Well, I, I think, and that's my personal opinion, and we obviously observe Iran from Afghanistan, which is right next door. Uh, there's a certain naivete um, in Washington, uh, certainly during the Obama administration, that they could will this deal into happening. They, they executed a deal which they thought would stop Iran. I, I personally, I have never believed that the Iranians will fully abide by whatever agreement they signed um, five or so years ago. Um, but now it's even worse because you have an angry, you know, more belligerent belliger- Iran. Uh, not, it's not going to fully trust Washington, but at the same time, it may view the very people who, who negotiated the last deal as weak. So it's the worst of the two combinations. They're dealing with this, you know, the previous team, which they never probably had much respect for. And at the same time, they, they, they're, they're angry. And of course, the very people you dealt with, the likes of Zarif and others, are no longer you know, as, as strong, or they probably never were that strong, but they have even less leverage today. And you know, you've got elections coming up in Iran. It's very doubtful that the liberals or the, the some moderates will emerge. I mean, even the word moderate is probably not a, the right term to, to use for these people. So I just think it's wishful thinking to, to, to assume we're gonna go back to where we were four or five years ago. Okay, last one for you, Sean. Uh, Sean, if you can uh, uh, keep this one brief, it's probably hard to keep brief, but you're, you seem a bit more bearish on the prospects for an economic recovery. Perhaps that's because of where you sit in uh, Western corners of Asia, but, but explain that if you would. Well, I just think that you know, the, the, and I think Sean's made an interesting point that that assuming that everything's going to be OK, that we're going to have uh, enough vaccines and we don't have another strain of the virus come up and, and so forth. Assuming all of those things, then we're going to be to sort of 2019 levels by 2021. I think uh, there's a lot of wishful thinking. I mean, I think for everything to go right, uh, which we all want, uh, we're assuming that nothing else will go wrong. You know, there's no conflict. There are no major environmental disasters. Uh, there's no, no other, there's no, there are no other strains of the coronavirus. Um, but again, my, again, I'm getting, getting back to politics. I think, you know, with trillions of dollars pumped into the 
uh, different economies, the world that has, again, less leverage. I mean, you look at the Brits who consistently have tied their aid to their uh, GDP growth. All of a sudden, they've stated that they're not going to be as engaged and they're not going to be as help, you know, in terms of aid and so forth. That's also going to be problematic from where we stand. For example, if the Americans or the Brits are the biggest contributors to, 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 to Pakistan, they're going to have far less leverage. So I think, I, I, you know, I think uh, a sort of a faltering economy, which is always possible, with in combination with what's, what's been going on over the last four years is a pretty bad combination. You have an international community with less, less leverage and things potentially going wrong. And of course, Bobby and others will talk about India. You know, we, we you know, this could be the, the sort of the calm before the storm, I'm afraid to say. Oh boy, that, that, to hear at the end of 2020 that it's the calm before the storm is a, is a tough note to end on, but I take your point. Saad Mosseini, thank you. We'll come back around uh, with you in the group uh, in a moment. Uh, let's go now to, to Sumi Terry, uh, uh, joining us also from here in New York. Sue is Senior Fellow uh, for Korea at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also a frequent uh, guest on our platform. She teaches at the Asian Studies Program at Georgetown University and, and prior to her tenure at CSIS. Uh, Sumi Terry was a senior analyst on Korean issues at the CIA for several years. Uh, Sue, you have sent a crystal ball uh, filled with predictions, uh, several of them, and I'll just maybe mention a few, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the Korea-related ones, if that's okay. Um, uh, Sue sent uh, a, a couple of, of domestic uh, predictions, that, that domestic U.S. that have uh, major overseas implications. One, that uh, the Democrats here will not win uh, those two Georgia Senate races, which are happening in a few weeks' time. Obviously, the implications there are, are, are uh, serious for the Biden administration, because uh, unless they win those two, they don't hold uh, the Senate. The Biden administration will, to pick up on things we've already talked about a little bit, move to re-enter the Iran deal or reinstate it and rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, but not the TPP. And then uh, Sumi Terry uh, sent a couple of, of, of items on, on the lighter side um, that uh, the movie industry, which has been so battered in 2020, will not only survive, but thrive uh, as the rebound begins in 2021. And that the Tokyo, what were the Tokyo 2020 games will indeed go on, as Sue says, with vaccinated crowds in attendance. So those would be some good news items. But Sue, let's come around to, to the main uh, focus focal point of your expertise, the Korean Peninsula. You had several thoughts uh, on that. Uh, begin wherever wherever you wish uh, on that front. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, let me just start with North Korea. So I think first and foremost, what's going to be different under President Biden is that, um, you know, obviously all the peasantry, all the drama, all the theatrics and all the exchange of love letters with Kim Jong-un would be would go out the door. I'm not saying that Biden is not going to meet uh, with Kim Jong-un or that he's he's gonna shut the door down to diplomacy. I think actually the opposite is going to be true. Uh, it's just that summitry would not be his first priority. So he's going to return to more of a traditional working level diplomacy, empowering negotiators. Uh, when President Trump thought he was really the best person to ne directly negotiate with Kim. But my prediction is also that President-elect Biden will launch a nuclear freeze arms control negotiations with North Korea possibly. And why do I say this? I think it's because first North Korea is now in a possession of nuclear arsenal that is more advanced uh, than ever before. Uh, and President-elect Biden will be the first American president to enter the office since North Korea demonstrated that it has a missile capable of hitting US mainland, which means the incoming Biden administration actually has lever less leverage today, I believe, uh, than even Trump had in uh, Singapore or in Hanoi, because today North Korea has amassed 20 to 30 uh, uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, they continue to churn out fissile material. Pyongyang has conducted some 30 ballistic missile tests since just Hanoi summit. And at the October 10th, parade, which celebrated the 75th anniversary of the ruling Workers' Party of Korea, we saw enormous uh, advancement on in their nuclear missile uh, 
program. Well, they paraded this two massive new sea and ground-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, including this monster-sized Hwasong-16, this new strategic weapon that Kim Jong-un himself had promised that the world would see earlier this year. Um, and this, the capabilities of this Hwasong-16 is such that not only does it have long-range cap uh, cap capability of hitting the entire U.S., mainland, it has this very large uh, advanced payload section. So I'm just saying the Biden administration is just going to have less leverage. So it could be that they are more realistic about what to do about North Korea and be open to this step-by-step -step approach that Tony Blinken and others have advocated um, and be open to this interim deal uh, with North. In fact, Tony Blinken has penned a New York Times op-ed piece that he thought the best possible model for a nuclear deal with North Korea is the JCPOA uh, with Iran. So, you know, in any interim deal, what would it include? You know, the North seizing for the production of fissile material, you know, putting limit to existing stockpile and closing down Yangbyon. And of course, a critical question there is whether to grant what well, they have to grant partial or how, how much of sanctions relief to grant in return for a pledge to cap. Uh, because, you know, North Korea is obviously all other uh, agreements have fall, you know, we, it fell apart. They fell apart over verification. And that's going to be also a key challenge too, over verification that North Koreans are probably not going to agree to, or it just, that's always have been a problem in the past. So yet another place where uh, the United States seems to arrive uh, at this moment of, of transition with less leverage. Uh, uh, Saad mentioned Afghanistan and Iran, and here we come to North Korea. Let me ask you what, what may count as, as a naive question, but I'll ask it anyway. There were those, I mean, obviously the results, as you say, Sue, of the, the summitry and the pageantry weren't great, right? I mean, I think any clear-eyed observer would say that. On the other hand, there were those at the time, and even since, who've said, look, a long, long stretch, I mean, successive administrations, both sides uh, of approaches to North Korea yielded Nothing. I mean, when, when Obama had that, that famous conversation with Trump, right, he spent a lot of time saying this is going to be the most dangerous thing that I'm leaving you with. So what is um, the interim approach you described notwithstanding? What's wrong with a smarter approach to summitry, given that it, it, it seems to, you know, at least on the, on the disrupting a status quo that never seems to get us anywhere? What, what would you advise... Um, the new administration uh, on the utility of such meetings? What would you say, you know, the Biden himself or the Secretary of State, uh, you know, ought to demand or ask for before engaging in that kind of personal diplomacy again? No, I don't think in theory, um, it is, you know, I'm against symmetry or having meet with Kim Jong-un. It's, it's just that, um, you know, all of, you know, if you read of, you know, uh, other folks account about these, uh, these summits, President Trump's side as much more, it was all, all about sort of media coverage and pageantry it was not really concerned about substance. But you're right. I mean, this goes back to early 1990s, right? The Clinton administration, the two-term two Bush administration, two-term Obama administration, which tried bilateral talks, uh, you know, 1994 agreed framework, multilateral negotiations, the six-party talks under Bush, which produced 2005 agreement, 2007. Um, and then President Obama with strategic patience for two terms, you know, what did it get us? So I'm not in theory, opposed to a trying to sit down with Kim Jong-un, but we have sat down with Kim Jong-un now three times. And what we got, and you, you on the October 10th grade, we, we've seen, I just listed out these things to you. They have made tremendous progress. Uh, so really num nothing has been gained since Singapore. In fact, we're worse off. Meanwhile, Kim has you know, gotten more, let's say, um, you know, recognition or sort of a legitimacy, we kind of legitimatized him in a sense that you know, President Xi Jinping has never met with Kim Jong-un until mm. President Trump decided to meet with him, right? So that's the first time that President Xi met with him since Kim Jong-un came into power, 
When he met with South Korean president multiple times, he didn't meet with Kim. And now sanctions enforcement are lax. Uh, Chinese and the Russians are not really implementing sanctions. So I'm all for smart way of doing this. But I think this we have now also tried just rushing into a summit. That's what I'm opposed to, just rushing into it. And I think what we have to really think about in this interim deal, in theory, is not a bad idea because all or nothing approach is not working. Uh, and I'm you know pretty hard nosed about North Korea. I'm pretty hard line. But I think it's time to think realistically also about how we approach North Korea. Um, and again, all or nothing approach is not going to get us. So, you know, smart, uh, smart diplomacy, principal diplomacy that Biden talks about, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Let me ask you a question uh, before we uh, we go over to Bobby Ghosh, uh, Sue, which is about COVID and North Korea. And this may be a very tough one to answer, but we had a discussion on this platform recently about uh, the North. And, and, and there are signs now that after saying for a while that they didn't have a problem, that they have a pretty severe problem. Of course, like everything else there, it's hard to know. Um, do you think there's, a, there's an opening, there's a window uh, in any discussions uh, with the North Koreans for, assuming they, they do have a problem, uh, for, for adding that to the plate of things that can be discussed in terms of assistance? Uh, well, first of all, what do you know about the situation there in those terms? And, and, and is that... Uh, uh, grounds for some sort of, of diplomacy on that front? Well, first of all, you know, North Koreans continue to insist that they have no confirmed COVID case, case, which is extremely hard to believe. But what's really interesting is that North Koreans are very paranoid about COVID. So they are the first country to close border with China um, in, in January. And these preventive measures they have taken, uh, closing off the border um, and so on, have completely decimated the economy, decimated tourism, the exports, imports. So these preventive measures have uh, have probably you know have greater impact on North Korea's economy than sanctions uh, even. So we know that Kim Jong Un is paranoid about COVID, and we know that North Korea's economy is suffering. And they, there was, they were already suffering under the impact of sanctions. Then you add the COVID measures. Um, and then they had a series of typhoons and floods and natural disasters. And now you've heard reports about North Korea hacking into AstraZeneca and you know seven other six other um, companies trying to you know they hacked in. So they want vaccines. So I think your question is a very interesting one. I do think we need to explore whether it's a potential for a leverage in terms of negotiation besides on the humanitarian front of helping them out with, with the vaccines. But yeah, Kim is very, very focused on Korea for somebody who says, you know, there's not a single person who's confirmed, who has a confirmed case of COVID. Right, I suppose I should have acknowledged that it's hard to help a country when the leader says there's no problem there. But Sumi, Terry, thanks, we'll come back around. You had some other interesting points, non-Korea related that we can come to, but let's go next uh, for predictions from our longtime friend, Bobby Ghosh, uh, member of the Executive Committee of the Asia Society Global Council, columnist, member of the editorial board at Bloomberg, uh, former international editor at Time, and uh, ran the Hindustan Times in India for, for a while. He's currently based in London, where he joins us today. Um, and Bobby is also a frequent commentator on foreign policy for MSNBC and CNN. Bobby, yours, uh, your, your forecast, I think, take us to South Asia, which we touched on just briefly with Saad Mousseni. Um, beginning with, um, with India and what you... Uh, uh, suggest or believe uh, will be some political and social turmoil coming and, uh, as you said, perhaps tarnishing Narendra Modi's aura of invincibility. That, by the way, is something we have talked about here in previous iterations of this event, uh, and uh, Modi seems to escape the tarnishing, uh, by and large. Uh, what's going to be different in 2021, do you think? Um, hi, uh, Tom, and, and thank you for having me uh, in this discussion. Uh, you know, you're right. The, the, the prime minister, his personal political stock does not seem to be greatly affected by um, the turmoil that's been taking place uh, in, the, in India. But you have to think that there is a, there is a finite point to that, that at a certain point, um, that kind of um, resilience of his personal brand Will will crumble, and and my my hunch is that when it does, it'll it'll sort of go off the side of a cliff rather than a sort of steady decline. We're seeing in India the 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 pain of um, sort of long term economic slowdown that's now being accelerated 
by the effects of the of the pandemic. And I agree with with what uh, Wei Jinshan said earlier, which is that India doesn't look like it's going to make any kind of it's been able to arrest this decline. Never mind making a China style comeback in the next couple of years. So the pain will deepen, and we've already begun to see some pushback from uh, from Indians against uh, the, the sort of Modi, BJP political sort of juggernaut. So recently, uh, in fact, they're still ongoing. Um, farmers, particularly in the northern part of the country, specifically from the, from the big farming state of Punjab, have been agitating against some of Modi's policies. The agitations are, are against specific policies to do with uh, price setting for, for grains, but there is a strong underlying factor, which is the, the, the state of the economy. If the economy was doing as well as it had five, seven, 10 years ago, the farmers might not be this uh, anxious about the pricing of their grains. They would have had much greater confidence in the market uh, to, to make sure they got a good price. Um, so that sort of begins to, to, to hint at uh, a sort of rising anger at the, the economic situation among Indians. Let's not forget that one of the most striking images of 2020 from India was the sight of hundreds of thousands, actually millions of poor uh, and lower middle class Indians from the big urban uh, agglomerations walking home, walking tens, hundreds of miles home to their villages because they had lost their jobs uh, in the city thanks to COVID, because they had no expectation that they would receive any kind of um, benefit that would that would allow them to sustain their lifestyles. So they were retreating to their homes in the countryside and the farmlands from where they had initially fled to go to the city. So that those people carried back with them a sense of, of anger and disappointment. Um, and I think we will see uh, the, the exodus may have stopped because frankly, there are not that many people left to go back. Uh, but the opportunities for them to come back into the cities and earn the living to sustain their families are not showing up. And until those op opportunities come up again, that anger will fester and deepen uh, and, and look for um, opportunities to express itself. Um, will it express itself directly at Modi? It's a, it's a $64,000 question. I suspect it, it will at least begin to in 2021. And are there, Bobby, any, uh, I mean, uh, not to put you in a position of advising the prime minister, but I mean, what, what can he, he has had a, a great gift for uh, whatever the, uh, the circumstances are and the issues are. Uh, here we sometimes refer to it as Teflon leadership or, or presidencies where no matter what the problems are, uh, certain leaders seem to be able to, to wangle their way out of them. But, uh, but that combination that you describe of, of poor economic performance running smack into uh, a really nasty, nasty case, almost as bad as ours here in the United States of the pandemic, um, what levers does he have or what, what tools in the toolbox to, to deal with this, to, to uh, maybe mitigate against uh, the prediction that you're, you're making for him? Well, I, I mean, um, you're right. He, he, he does have that Teflon quality. He's also, if this is the right word, blessed with a, with a particularly uh, incompetent uh, opposition. Um, and, and that has helped as well. Nobody has been able to capture this, this sense of disappointment uh, in India's economy that many Indians feel. No political uh, opponent of Modi's has been able to harness that and turn it into capital. Um, and I think that is in part, uh, that has informed the government's sort of rather poor response to COVID and a kind of lack of... Um, Interest may not be the right word, but a lack of urgency in addressing the economic issues. Um, I think there is a sense of overconfidence, uh, uh, self-satisfaction. Um, the, the, the election victory from a couple of years ago was huge. And it allowed, I think, the BJP and the prime minister and people around him to feel like they were 
untouchable um, in the American sense, not the Indian one. Um, and that uh, you can see um, manifestations of that in the way the government has behaved since the start of the, um, the, the pandemic and the response, which has been sort of almost uh, um, desultory. Uh, at, in, in the beginning, um, th there was no, it was very much like uh, the response we saw in parts of the U.S., in Brazil. Um, and um, But once the science began to become clear that this could not be wished away, there was a response, but it was very poor. It was, it was very poorly organized. All of the, the failings of the Indian government system that Modi has not addressed in the four and some years that he has been in power, the 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 the, in, the, the, the bureaucracy's uh, inability to respond to crises like this, all of these things have now come to a to a head. Um, now, um, Modi will have to steer the ship while uh, uh, in a storm while conducting repairs to the hull, which would be incredibly difficult for any leader anywhere in the world, um, but all the more so for a leader who's never had to do this. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So Bobby, uh, the other thing I want to raise is something you actually wrote in a piece uh, for Bloomberg, uh, I believe. Uh, let me just read an excerpt. This has to do with other smaller countries and impacts that they've had um, from, from the, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, you wrote that the pandemic will force countries that export labor and depend heavily on remittances to recalibrate their economies. As states that rely on foreign workers accelerate efforts towards self-reliance, the so-called, quote, remittance economies, unquote, will struggle to accommodate returning prodigals as well as new generations entering the worst workforce. This represents major challenges for Asian countries such as the Philippines, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So it's a really interesting point that, you know, big countries get so concerned given what's happened to supply chains and everything, they gotta make everything themselves but boy, that's a big domino effect. Um, and talk about how you see that playing out in, in the year or maybe even years uh, to come. Well, I, I wrote a very long piece about this early uh, in the year when the, when the first uh, wave of the pandemic was, uh, was being sort of felt. Um, in, my, in my day job at Bloomberg, I focus a lot of my attention on the Middle East and North Africa. And of course, in the Middle East, in the, in the oil, uh, the, the shakedowns, um, foreign labor keeps those uh, economies going, keeps the wells pumping, keeps uh, um, home fires burning back home. So countries like India, um, Bangladesh, the Philippines, and Egypt, and others depend very heavily on remittances coming um, not just from sort of for labor abroad, but specifically from uh, labor in the Persian Gulf countries. Um, now, in the Persian Gulf countries, for several years now, governments have been talking about lowering their dependence. Um, they've struggled to actually achieve this because the, 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 their own populations don't always have the right mix of, of skills as well as a willingness to work for low salaries that these, uh, the expat uh, labor brings. But with COVID, the, the process of, um, has, has accelerated. Two things have happened. First, uh, the, the Gulf governments have uh, have basically sent home a lot of workers. Uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of workers have had to go back home. Um, the the Gulf economies were pretty pretty shaken up early on, uh, and a lot of jobs that previously existed for these people um, just went away, um, particularly in the service sector. Now, when the recovery really begins, and let's keep our fingers crossed that that happens in 2021. A lot of the governments in Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman, uh, and so on, have the opportunity to build a little bit from close to scratch and, and, and try to make sure that when jobs become available, that those jobs are, uh, are made available to their, their own populations before um, uh, the, the foreign labor is allowed back in. Many of these governments have, have sort of now got uh, numbers. They have targets of, of what proportion of jobs have to be local. And, and they've also got targets for how many visas they will issue for foreign workers. And, and so 
for countries like Bangladesh, like India and, and the Philippines, this is this is a huge problem for mm-hmm. for two generations now. These countries have depended on on remittances for tens of billions of dollars coming into the country every year, uh, without really thinking very much about a rainy day. Uh, and guess what? It's raining now, and uh, and those governments have no plans in place to deal with it. Well, thank you, Bobby Ghosh. And uh, last, certainly not least, you've been very patient, Stephen Englander. Uh, we come to uh, come back to, to business in the global economy, which is where we began this conversation. Uh, Stephen is head of global G10 FX research uh, for Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, before that, head of research for Rafiki Capital Management, which is a, an Asia-based hedge fund. And uh, before that, Stephen Englander led uh, G10 FX strategy at Citibank. Uh, he is a member of the Asia Society Business Council. Uh, Steve, it's great to have you with us. And uh, uh, you really come to some very core issues, super important in terms of the global economy, um, inflation, the U.S. dollar and trade. And I couldn't help but notice uh, my copy of The Economist arrived uh, just the other day. There it is. I guess that's <laughs> the one. Will inflation return? And, you know, I love The Economist, but they do a classic uh, kind of hedging on it, on the one hand, on the other hand, and I'm not really sure where they stand. So why don't we start with that? Uh, are we going to uh, have a, a, a return of inflation? Uh, with, I mean, great if you can stick to Asia as much as possible, but your answer to that and then the implications, whatever your answer is. Well, look, it's not in our forecasts. Um, you know, as previous speakers uh, have mentioned, the um, lots of Asia is uh, going to be struggling to recover to previous levels of activity, never mind kind of getting to levels that would generate inflation. Uh, you know, even China is, you know, which seems to be ahead of, you know, both in Asia and with respect to the rest of the world, we really don't see any serious inflation pressures uh, emerging anytime, um, anytime soon. Um, if anything, the, the recent data on, on inflation are kind of on, you know, surprises are to the downside, not to the upside. Um, that said, look, the, there is a global risk here, and we, we we should all know we're playing with fire. That the um, you, you know you look at the U.S. fiscal discussion, it's like how much money can we spend. Um, not how much production can we restore. So I think that there, there, there's a sense that there's so much stimulus in the world, both you know, in, in Asia, um, in the West, uh, that the degree of stimulus is outstripping uh, the rebound in production. And you ask how long can this last? Now I would say, and, and this touches you know, on, on the dollar question, I, I'd say certainly on, on the U.S. side, that the a weaker dollar is probably, um, you know, over the next year or so, the, the biggest inflation risk that we're going to face, much weaker than what we've seen now. If the, this trend continues, uh, we see prices pick up, but that will also have an impact on the rest of the world through the impact on uh, commodity prices, food prices, energy prices, and, and so on. Uh, I, I think on the domestic side, the, there are very few countries that will face these pressures. And there are a lot of countries that are willing to step in uh, to substitute for any uh, country that's, you know, where inflation is really taking off. So, you know, um, there's probably 30 countries where my shirt can get made. And if there's an inflation surge in one, uh, there's a line of countries willing to, to take over that capacity. Uh, that said, I'd say that the risks are, are more to the upside than to the downside, in, in the sense that relative to our baseline, which is continued moderate inflation, you just see this buildup of financial assets. You see this um, sort of full steam ahead globally towards trying to get as much recovery as possible. Um, we could get inflation. And I would say one last comment that even though all central banks talk about inflation, their targets, what what the success would be if they reached it, um, that's not really the case. I, I think that you know if we reached our you know the Fed's two percent sustainable two percent inflation goal with the unemployment rate at ten percent, that would be a catastrophe. The same issue applies 
in Asia and in the rest of the world that um, you want to get to inflation, but only when you're at an acceptable level of production, an acceptable level of employment. Um, so you want to get there, but you don't want to get there too fast. You want to leave as much room as possible to, to recover. So I, I think that the this inf inflation um, targeting has is a two-edged sword. You don't want to get to your inflation target too fast, but you don't want to be in a situation where inflation keeps falling. It's really interesting, Steve. Thank you. So, so game out. What you described then as the bigger threat, or I think you said biggest threat, which is which is a falling dollar. Um, and not to put you on the spot, but I guess this is all about putting people on the spot, right? Like, how low do you think it uh, it, it may go, and how you know how long might that period of decline be? It, there's a good chance we're we're talking about um, you know like a 2002 to 2009 type of decline uh, for the dollar here. The uh, you know what we're seeing in in the short term. What what we're seeing, what we're emphasizing in the dollar weakness, is that um, we're maintaining demand. We're not maintaining production. So out of the last four months, three months have been record merchandise trade deficits, right? Because we were we're, we're not we're not producing, but we are uh, importing a lot. Um, at the same time, it's pretty clear that U.S. interest rates aren't going to go up very much, and so. Compared to the rest of the world, um, you know, USD assets are becoming less attractive. And in a way, it's almost been a flip around from four or five years ago. If you thought what kind of made the dollar strong, it was US rates were higher. It's a stable currency, a low beta currency, and the economy was doing pretty well compared to everyone else. And if you said, OK, let's see who is, you know, which country uh, checks those boxes now. Um, take a look at China. You know, we're, you know, we and, and, and our, our earlier speaker kind of discussed, you know, how Chinese growth is rebounding. We're going to hit new highs. Um, you know, data keeps surprising on the upside. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at Chinese rates. We expect them to be going up next year. And they already have a interest rate differential, uh, both real and, you know, inflation corrected and nominal against the, the US. And it certainly is a very low, uh, very stable currency. So in what's happened is that China in particular, but you know, Asia as a group, you know, ever since um, August, because of the rebound in its characteristics, they have read, led the charge against the dollar. And other currencies have benefited as well. Now we're likely to see this continue next year, certainly to the middle of next year. I think at that time, um, the uniqueness of Asia and, and China in terms of having restored uh, supply chains and production capacity will be mitigated because we'll, the U.S. Will, and Western Europe will be coming online again. But I think we are still in a situation where U.S. Um, assets and U.S. yields could be unattractive for a while. Our forecast is that uh, we could see China appreciate another 4 or 5% from from current levels, we could see Europe go up about three and a half percent. But you know, I'd say certainly on the dollar side, the risk is that the this move is much bigger um, and lasts much longer. Okay, um, I'd like if I can because I'm, there's questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Oscar, uh, maybe you can bring in all our our group together now. I think that's uh, going to be Steve, Saad, Bobby, and and Sue. Um, and if you can all unmute, uh, but, but Steve, I'll stick with you because we have a question about something that we've just raised uh, um, briefly earlier, which is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And this is something um, I know you uh, are, are deeply involved in too, which is trade policy generally. But the question is, um, uh, in terms of all these deals we've been talking about that the Biden administration might come back to that are Obama era uh, arrangements. Uh, what do you think the odds are that the Biden administration will uh, have enthusiasm for some sort of re-engagement on the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and, and how would that work? So I'll take that with Steve, and then we can uh, we can have the group together. Well, let me say more broadly that I, I think the good news is that the U.S. isn't going to take any kind of unilateral measures um, under Biden the way they did under Trump. Uh, 
you know, TPP, you know, the Obama administration negotiated it, backed away from it because the mood against trade uh, was so strong. Um, Biden has emphasized his buy U.S. policy, which um, it's not been really discussed at, at, at length, but, you know, certainly doesn't sound like a, global, you know, friendly global trade policy. I, I think that they will re-engage with TPP because it's a way of... Um, re-engaging with its partners in, in, in Asia and, and kind of getting the U.S. back in the game. Uh, whether they actually go into it, I, I think, is, is going to be a different question. I think the negotiations will be longer um, th than many think. Um, you know, similarly, I, I think that the uh, even though they won't be raising tariffs on China anymore, that the discussion of how quickly will these tariffs be removed and what they expect China to deliver for the removal that will be a longer discussion than expected as well. Um, the last thing I'd say is one thing I would look for is to see how they use the various trade remedies that are in the law. For example, Commerce Department last year said that an undervalued currency uh, could be an indication or could be used to indicate unfair trade practices resulting in sanctions. Whether they actually, you know, if they say, well, we're not, just not going to use that. That makes no sense. Or whether they, it's actually a, a tool that they consider using, I think will be very important in terms of gauging just how deep the commitment is to um, restoring trade. But I, I, I would be a little bit cautious about things improving, even though I'd be optimistic that things won't deteriorate from here on. Okay. Thank you, Steve Englander. Now, um, we have a question which I think could go to Bobby Ghosh or Saad Mosseni, although uh, w welcome any of you uh, to jump in on any of these. But this is really a follow on, uh, Bobby, to what you were talking about vis-a-vis uh, -vis Narendra Modi's problems in India. The uh, question is, how much do you think the BJP, uh, Mr. Modi's party, uh, will benefit from increased tensions with its neighbors, China, Pakistan, versus the disillusionment from how the country is handling the pandemic? Uh, well, it's certainly, the BJP certainly benefited from tensions uh, with Pakistan ahead of the last general election. Um, the, the Modi administration, uh, made the, the propaganda machine of the BJP and the prime minister's office was able to turn that into, into political gold dust. And, 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 and sort of there was a significant bump uh, in 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 popularity ratings and in, in the vote count uh, at the end. But you can only go to that well so many times. Um, and despite the what I would describe as quite substantial media capture in India by the Modi government, uh, the fact is that, that people are, it is beginning to dawn on people that, uh, that despite the government's uh, claims that they managed to stand down a confrontation with the Chinese. The fact is that the Chinese have in fact taken over uh, hundreds of square kilometers of, of, of territory that India claims to be its own. Um, and so the, you know, in a country as large and open as India, it's, it's hard to control the message constantly and, and sooner or later the facts do filter through. Um, so yes, the, uh, whoever is in, in power uh, does tend to benefit a little bit when there is a, a external threat or when there's a perception of an external threat. But at the end of the day, uh, economics tends to count above everything else. Um, mm -hmm. Two years ago, when um, the, uh, the, the last spasm of tensions with Pakistan uh, um, sort of erupted, the economic situation wasn't great, but was a lot better than it is now. Um, as more and more Indians are, are forced out of, the, uh, of their jobs by the pandemic and a slowing economy, and fewer and fewer Indians are able to get into the, the job market at all, you're creating a very, very substantial body of people for whom uh, these distractions will matter less and less. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to add to that? If not, I've got one for you lined up here, but you can have both if you like. Do you have anything to add to what Bobby just said about, about Modi's uh, sort of using tensions, if that's what he's doing uh, uh, in his neighborhood to, to help himself politically? Yeah, my, my concern is that, um, that uh, having met uh, 
the opposition is that uh, there's no alternative to Modi. Um, I was very underwhelmed. <laughs> there's only one person, but by meeting the opposition leader um, in Delhi, uh, you know, he has no alternative policies. He obviously doesn't seem like very hardworking. Um, I'm less uh, optimistic than than Bobby is. I think that Modi is a is sort of a Teflon man. I think that even if the party loses its popularity, he'll remain, a, you know, uh, for the foreseeable future as a sort of a powerful, very, the most powerful figure in India. Good okay. or bad economy. And then sticking with you, Saad, because uh, there's a, a follow-up on Afghanistan. Do you see a good news scenario of any kind in the coming year in Afghanistan? That is, uh, do you, and I guess this is, on the, and on the other hand point, or do you anticipate other countries taking a more active role in, uh, in trying to help stabilize as the U.S. takes a more drastic troop reduction? Anyway, is, is there a good news way that things may play out with the peace talks and everything else you, you raised earlier? Well, I, I think the peace talks, I mean, we have a few months, obviously, from now till May. Uh, I, I think if they really push hard, then a lot of things fall into place. There is a possibility of of the two sides sitting and negotiating and coming up with a with an alternative that's better than what we have today. Compromises on both sides, we're not necessarily gonna have the most uh, liberal society. We will have issues with radicalization and so forth, but it's better than the sort of violence we're seeing today. But that's the best case scenario. And the best right. case scenario would still involve insurgency, violence, you know, you'll have ISIS and other groups who are not going to be part of this peace deal. The worst case scenario is going to be a full on civil war fueled by money and assistance and weapons from our neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sumi Terry, uh, you have a question, uh, comes in via email now. Um, uh, do you see improved coordination and relations between Japan and South Korea? Now that the United States, uh, in more ways than one, is back with the Biden administration, there's more to it than that. But I mean, um, uh, do you see some, I guess, a rosy, rosier picture between those two countries? Well, certainly an improvement, because I think the Biden administration will f focus on improving Korea-Japan relations and, you know, focus on restoration of trilateral coordination uh, among U.S., South Korea, and Japan as a foundation for dealing with North Korean regional issues. We know that Korea-Japan relationship is unpopular at the best of times. It's really difficult. Um, so it's hard to fundamentally change in a big way. Um, surveys and polls still show that Koreans consistently rank, the, uh, the, uh, rank Japan less favorably than China and Russia. Uh, and it's, I mean, low points even below North Korea. So you, you so fundamentally, it's hard. Um, it's hard for South Korean leaders to genuinely improve a relationship with Tokyo. But that said, um, Biden administration will work hard to curtail the downturn on Korea-Japan uh, relationship. Tony Blinken, when he was a deputy secretary of state during the Obama administration, he worked very hard to drive that relationship forward. Uh, he initiated quarterly trilateral meetings, insisted on concrete results. So, you know, some improvement, although the, you know, the historical stuff and all, it, it's hard to, you know, but I will see still some improvement, I think, because of the U.S. leadership and U.S. engagement on this issue. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Sue. Um, Steve Englander, uh, here's a big one. Biggest risk to global markets, China's debt, U.S.-China trade war deteriorating f further, something else we are not seeing elsewhere in the world that can affect the world's two largest economies that might lead to a spiral. Okay, we asked Saad for a good news scenario. We're asking you for a bad one. What's Wow, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I think trade is kind of a sideshow now that the... Um, it's just hard to see, you know, unless they, they act, actually, this would be a major deal. If instead of sort of tariffing up, um, you know, toys and, you know, whatever, um, they, something occurred so that the U.S. took real action to cut China off the international financial system. That would be major, major. I mean, China is working very hard to internationalize its currency. It's becoming 
a reserve currency, albeit slowly, it's, it's opening up its markets to make it international. But I'd say that right now, were things, and we certainly don't expect this, but were things to deteriorate so badly that you know, access to the international financial system would, uh, you know, and, and dollar payment system were cut off. That would be major, major, and, and not just for China, it would be for the whole world in, in terms of how that happens um, and what the implications would be. Uh, I'd, I'd say, look, you know, the, we, we know that there are tensions over uh, Taiwan and, you know, you know, hopefully those, those tensions don't, don't erupt into something bigger, but that would be a major um, global issue were, were it to happen. Um, you know, and, and again, there are other issues that are, are we're, we're sort of taking for granted. We're assuming that, you know, the COVID vaccines work and that, you know, by mid-year, everything will be bouncing back. Um, were that not to happen, that would be pretty catastrophic. And, and again, I'd say that the difficulties that sort of Western countries have had in, in dealing with it probably makes them more vulnerable if there's a disappointment on mm -hmm. that score. And the last thing I would say is this, that even if things work out, you know, on the COVID side, um, you know, and we're all sort of going to the movies and, uh, you know, jumping on airplanes and, and doing all the stuff we did uh, a year ago, um, we're, it's not clear what the implications are, long-term implications are, that you know, a lot of companies have been on life support, uh, you know, depended on extremely cheap credit, depended on, on subsidies from the government to keep employment up. We, we can be in a good health situation, but if it turns out that the fundamental sort of well-being of our economy has been impaired over the long term, um, you know, we start seeing a wave of bankruptcy, whether household or business bankruptcies, that would also sort of really unwind the optimism uh, that we have right now. Okay. I want to, we, we need to wind down in our, our final minutes here. I just want to do two things before we do. Uh, first, because I did not, uh, I did not prep any of you for this. So I'll give you a moment to think, but I'd love to, to finish uh, this event at the end of this tumultuous year, if I can ask each of you, and it can be about anything, for one piece of, Steve just used the word optimism, what's one thing, whether it's really serious or, or something in the lighter fare category that you are optimistic about for 2021? I'll give you a moment to think about that while I share just a couple of notes that came to us uh, from across our global network uh, um, in preparation for, for this event and the end of the year. Barbara Demick, who is uh, an award-winning author um, uh, and, uh, and won the prize, the Oz Elliott Prize for, for journalism in Asia that we uh, administer each year. Uh, she uh, says, I sadly predict an advance for the techno-autocracy. The same apps used for contact tracing can be deployed post-pandemic to track who is meeting with whom or attending a protest, or perhaps visiting a house of worship, uh, a, a quite negative uh, uh, forecast and, and concern of hers that we've not talked about. Rana Forohar, you probably all know her at the, at the Financial Times, uh, also a frequent guest on our platform, said, uh, we will see a dramatic shift away from a tangible economy towards a more intangible virtual one, which will have massive impacts on labor markets, stock valuations, and monetary policy. The risk is a winner-take-all economy on steroids. The opportunity is that decentralized technologies can help us share the pie more evenly. And lastly, Bing Chen, who's an entrepreneur and a member of our uh, Asia 21 Young Leaders Network, uh, very simple thing. We will continue spending more time with fewer people. So uh, <laughs> with that, and if we're looking for a, a sliver of optimism, I will throw out uh, that we will have something of a return to decency at the highest level uh, of, of political office in this country, and that will at least begin to uh, uh, repair uh, the United States relationship around the world. And, and my own view, and I think I'm swimming upstream on this one, is that Trumpism uh, is going to, in its severest forms anyway, uh, fizzle in the years ahead. Um, why don't we go in the order that we went before Saad Mosseini? Uh, if, if I ask you for some reason to be hopeful as we turn the, the calendar year, uh, what would you say? 
I think, uh, you know, which I'm looking forward to is a packed uh, restaurant or a, you know, bar or, or something. I think that, uh, I, I think we appreciate uh, engagement with other individuals, uh, socializing with them. I actually disagree that we're going to go, with, that we've uh, crossed the point of no return. I think we will be more social, more sociable and more engaged physically with other individuals and probably collaborating work-wise. And that to me is, is something to look forward to. I can't wait to see you at that packed restaurant. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, already going to pack, I'm already going to packed restaurants in Dubai and Kabul. I'd like to do it in New York though. Yeah, yeah, they just shut down indoor dining yesterday here. Uh, Sumi, Terry, have you some reason to be hopeful for 2021? Yes, I'm going to throw out one serious and one not so serious. One first one is that President Biden will conclude these burden sharing negotiations with South Korea and Japan because his approach to alliance is that one that's familiar to all of us, more conventional alliance management, more institution based. You know, it's going to be a departure from America first orientation, transactional approach and all that. Exhaustion phase is over. Burden sharing will be done. On on the on the lighter side, I do think movie theaters will survive and even thrive alongside the streaming services, as you mentioned earlier. But because the history of technology is not either or situation, it's of end. So movies did not place, you know, uh, did not replace stage uh, plays, right? Radios did not replace movies. Uh, TV did not replace radio or movies, you know. So I think an internet did not replace radio, TV, or movies. So I think, you know, uh, theaters will continue to exist. They will, you know, people will go again because they offer a communal uh, experience and a viewing experience, bigger screens, better sound that you can possibly get home. Oh, one more thing. Tokyo Olympics will be held as planned with vaccinated crowds in attendance. Vaccines will be widely available next summer. Holding Olympics will be an international priority as a sign of normalcy. Japan will have a, you know, a lot invested in this and they will have resources to, resources to vaccinate. So that's another positive news. Oh, you're making me feel so much better. Uh, Bobby Ghosh, what have you got? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to visualize what, uh, what Sue just said of, of an Olympics in which uh, the spectators are taking drugs and the athletes are not. Um, <laughs> but that would be a fine thing. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm also looking forward to, to attending, uh, to going with Saad Mosaini to those crowded restaurants, wherever they may be. Um, if I may, uh, the, the two things I'm optimistic about, one in general terms and one very specific. Generally, I'm optimistic about science. I think uh, 2020 uh, has, despite all the, 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 the sort of counter messaging from populists uh, from Trump on downwards, 2020 will be uh, at least the second half of 2020, the last bit of 2020, uh, and the first bit of 2021 will be looked back. I think we'll look back on it as the return of science uh, and, and it, the vaccines, the administration of the vaccines um, and the recovery that they will bring will, I, I think, uh, give us a, uh, a new appreciation for what science does uh, for, for mankind. From the, a little more specific to the part of the world that I was covering in this discussion, I'm very optimistic about Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, is already almost there, and I think in 2021 will become the most successful economy in South Asia. That has not happened in my in Bangladesh's entire existence, um, and that is a sobering note for uh, its bigger cousins, uh, India and Pakistan, uh, as they struggle with their economies. Bangladesh, per capita terms, growth terms will be the success story in a very bleak time, uh, it mm -hmm. has to be said, but a success story for South Asia. Thank you, Bobby Ghosh. Steve Englander, you get the last word, and it's gotta well, be an optimistic uh, word. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one serious and one not serious and let you decide which is which. Um, look, I, I, I think I'm more optimistic about the emerging markets world than any time over the last decade. And for two reasons, one, a weak dollar um, it may reflect weakness in the U.S., but it's actually great for emerging markets. It means that their debt problems are mitigated, their external debt problems are mitigated. It means that commodity prices are, are higher, which by and large is good for EM. And I think that one of the things that's not going to change, our best you know, personal protective equipment is our car, our homes, you know, in addition to masks, obviously, and so on. But um, this shift in demand that we're seeing away from services 
towards tangible goods. You know, housing is booming like it hasn't done in 15 years. It requires uh, tangible inputs. People buy cars, furniture, everything when they buy a house. It's true not just in the U.S. It's true elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, this is a shift in demand. Marginal demand in the world is going to be for tangible goods, which is very good for EM, not services, which tends to be much more domestic focused. Um, the other piece of optimism um, that's out there is I really do expect that by the fall of next year, I'll be able to watch the New York Jets lose in person as opposed to you know sitting in my living room and watching them lose um, on my flat screen. So uh, there's a lot to look forward to. <laughs> you managed to, to throw ooh, some optimism ooh. into, I'm not, I'm not a Jets fan, but uh, optimism into a, into a pessimistic world. Listen, uh, thank you all. Before I do my formal thank yous, just a word to our audience um, uh, around the world. Uh, and we do this typically, we do this event typically in person. Uh, I wanna thank you all. We've had more than 300 events uh, on this global platform in a way we never dreamed we would uh, a year ago, um, uh, but we've, we've had them produced by all our centers. And I do want to ask, as I do at the uh, year-end event, typically when we're uh, up here on, on Park Avenue at our headquarters, uh, that if you are so inclined to uh, uh, make a contribution to the Asia Society for uh, the work that we do in person, virtually, and everything in between, uh, it's easy, asiasociety.org slash donate. AsiaSociety.org slash donate. Every little bit helps um, help us have a more optimistic year as well. Um, but uh, really great thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you to Saad Mosseini, Stephen Englander, Sumi Terry, and Bobby Ghosh, and Wei Jin Shan, who, who had to leave a bit early. Um, it's always uh, appreciated when we um, uh, have experts. Uh, uh, it's the ninth year we've run this uh, to put themselves uh, out on the line a little bit, but you've given us a ton to think about. And, uh, and thank you also for leaving us on, uh, on high notes and optimistic notes. Uh, again, I'm Tom Nagorski uh, in New York. Uh, for all of us at the Asia Society, uh, thank you and uh, all the best for a great 2021.